Uh, whenever you're ready, James, let me know. Hi, everybody. This is the archive of the uh, Becoming a Community Builder Leadership Pro... What the hell is the name of this program? <laughs> leadership Boot Camp. RMWB's Leadership Boot Camp. It is the uh, Becoming a Community Builder. It's the archive of the Fort McMurray evening session at Keanu College. You're watching in your pajamas. Cover up. Come on, we can see you. Stop that. And um, it's the third session, the uh, big picture holistic systems thinking. Okay, with that, tell me something that you took away from the last three weeks. As we always do, do some reflection. Yes. Um, the listening. How'd that go? Does anybody remember why it, how you doing big fella? Anybody remember why is it so hard to listen? Well, first of all, let's back up. Why in today's day and age is it important? I mean, on the surface, it's self-evident on why it's important to listen. Why is it important to listen in the context of expanding your sphere of influence? By building, what's that? Because it does build trust. Why does it build trust today? Beyond the self-evident. Why? Anybody remember? It gives them a, some idea about their communication style. Okay, so I, I recognize their communication style. Somebody go a lot deeper. Which is, you're right, but let's pull back the onion even deeper to understand the context that we're operating in today. Remember, we're operating in a user-driven society where people are prosumers. They're producers of content. They produce content on their Facebook page. They produce content in, on their Twitter account. They produce content on their YouTube account. What do I mean by produce content? They push out, push out, push out, which means they're probably, as a society, we've probably gotten pretty poor at listening. And yet, what's the number one way to help a person feel validated? As a human being, when they feel like you understand them. The day you say, Ian really understands me, is the day I just started to build a trusting relationship with you. Am I right or wrong about that? If you looked at me and said, Ian understands me, you're on my team. We're on board. We're together. We're in alignment, man. I don't need to do anything else. The day I can tip that scale to Ian understands me, I'm in. Now, I'm not in for nefarious or manipulative reasons. I just know we have a bond. Because you come to a conclusion where you feel understood. The day you feel understood is the beginning of the trusting relationship. What's the number one way to help you get to a place you feel understood? Is to what? Listen. Not talk. You will never feel understood if I just talk at you. Talk, 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 talk. And yet, if you remember from the whole week's worth of emails, the whole idea to expand your sphere of influence was, I got to understand you to your satisfaction. Now I have an opportunity to build trust with you. Now I can influence the situation. So if I want to expand my sphere of influence, here I am right here, and I want to expand my sphere of influence into other stakeholder groups, the only way this stakeholder, this other person of influence, is going to move, is going to react, is going to do anything for me, is if they feel like I understand their needs, wants, hopes, desires, and goals. And it all begins with listening. Have you ever had a person that listened so well to you, it made you feel like you were the only person in the room? Has anybody ever had that? Did they need a business card after that? No. They don't need a business card. Because you felt like, wow. They really understood me. Or wow, they really know who I am. Wow, out of all these people in the room. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of this listening thing. Ross saw me today. We did a little exercise. Yeah, we did a lot of exercises today. But remember we talked about being relatable? That in the past, in the past, I didn't have to worry about building trust. Because you and I grew up in the same neighborhood or the same area. We probably had the same religious views or worldview. 
We probably ate the same kind of food, listened to the same kind of music, and we probably had a generational connection to that area. Or if you and I moved to an area, we probably moved to an area where we were like the other people in the area. I'm talking over the last hundred years, right? Today, all of a sudden, I don't know your worldview. I'm not sure what kind of food you're eating. It looks a lot different than the food that I'm eating. The music that's coming out of your car is a little bit different than the music that comes out of my car. And I start going like this. What? I don't understand you. Am I right or wrong about that? And all of a sudden, there's a lack of trust. So I've got to proactively build trust, which is completely different than networking, which is completely different than schmoozing, which is completely different than shaking hands and kissing babies. It's completely different because it works off the premise that I'm not trying to get anything from you. I'm just trying to understand your needs, your wants, your hopes, your desires and aspirations in an attempt to gain alignment. Let me just better understand you. If we end up doing a business transaction, great. If we end up working and, and volunteering together, awesome. Fine, but that's not the purpose of the activity. The purpose of the activity, come on in, how are you? The purpose of the activity is just to build a trusting relationship. When I begin to aggressively listen to people, their needs, their wants, their hopes, their desires, asking open-ended questions, 80% of the listening, 20% of the talking, I start to realize some amazing things about people. I recognize untapped talent. I recognize a burning passion that they have inside themselves. It's a lot easier for me to marshal human capital when I actually listen to what Sonia wants out of life. And then I help her reach it. I help her reach it. Little tip, try this for the next couple days. Whoever you're standing in front of at any given time, not only are you gonna to listen to them like they're gonna die at midnight, but you're gonna do this. You're gonna bring some kind of value, something. Enhance their life in some way. So now that I'm actively listening, really listening, like I'll give you an example. There's a guy that was in the last course. Remember, he was here the first night. Big, big, tall guy, right? One night, he gave me a ride back to the hotel. I sat and I listened to his vision, listened to his dream, listened to what he wanted to do. He has this great vision of a, a banking opportunity. It's kind of like a bank and within his culture and no interest and he just got great ideas. And every once in a while, when I would come across unique financing, because I used to be in the venture capital business, I would send him a note, unsolicited, just, hey, I saw this article. Hey, I saw this thing. Hey, I saw that thought. And I don't know, you'd have to ask him, but I think one of the reasons he came that night was just because he wanted to say, hey man, thanks for sending me all that stuff. Now, did I send him all that stuff because I want something from him, yes or no? No, I sent him because he told me of a dream, I come across something, I send it. I guarantee you, well I can't guarantee you, but I think if I ever did need anything, I could call him and say, hey brother, could you help me with something? And he'd probably say what? Yes. So it's not that you're trying to get something, it's that you're trying to help another person reach their dreams and goals, asking nothing in return, and you're expanding your sphere of influence as you do it. Is there historical reference point for this approach? Who can give me a historical reference point for a guy who actually did what I'm talking about on a national and international level and, and took on, the at the time, the strongest empire at the time? Anybody know who it was? Who was it? It was Gandhi. He went from little town to little town to little town to little town, making deposit, making deposit, making deposit, helping people, helping people, helping people, because he saw injustice, he saw injustice, he saw injustice, he saw, and he gave. And then one day he said, hey, I need about a million of you to show up at a beach. Come on down. If you saw the movie, right? That's the Coles notes of history right there. And, and they all showed up. Did he have Facebook? Did he have Twitter? No. Did he have Facebook? Did he have Twitter? Did he have some kind of special media campaign? No. no. He had this. He made a deposit in a human being's life. And I don't think he made that deposit strategically that someday I'm going to take on the British and we're going to salt and we're going to have... I don't think he did that. I, I don't. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I, I didn't grow up there. I don't know the history. But just from what I read and from what I've learned, I don't think that that's the case. I think that 
I think it was just a natural extension of him giving to others. So here's your task. Just start giving to others. Just start giving of yourself. There's an old proverb that says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I freely give. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I freely give. So I might not have money to give you, but I have a kind word to give you. I might not have a, 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 a toonie to give you, but I give you some of insight or wisdom that I have. What I, what I have, I will feel, I'll freely give. I'll just freely give. I'll just freely give. I'll just freely give. Do you think you would begin to build a reputation in the community, yes or no? Do you think that you would start to have opportunities start to flow your way, yes or no? Do you think that people would want to align themselves with you, yes or no? So it's not brain surgery. But it all starts with this. I can't give you something unless I've listened to you to understand what you're looking for. Now it really makes an impact because I paid attention. What he was saying to me in that car that night in front of the hotel was, I need some other ideas of how to finance, to build this financing mechanism for the people of my culture. I need to better understand it. I've only got a very narrow view. That's what he was saying. Now he never asked me to send him anything, but that's what he was saying. So an article here, a link there, a PDF here, a link there, to send him info. Now whatever the kid does with it, I don't know, but just send it to him. Are you listening? Now take the next step. Bring value to people, bring value to people. Somebody said to me one time, if you were gonna go into a community and start a business and expand that business, what would you do? I would go to that community, I would make a list of all of the people of influence, and then I would go build a trusting relationship with those people. Then I'd open the business. Then I'd open the business. Because I would have these people of influence who would be walking around saying what? Well, he's a good guy. Let's go to his restaurant. He's a good guy. Well, let's go to his shop. He's a good guy. Gosh, he gave freely of himself and asked nothing in return. I know I'm harping on this, but if you're going to be an agent of change, how are you going to change something? By building trusting relationships because that's what the times require. There was a time when the times require you carrying a big sword. And that's how you affected positive change. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I have the biggest sword in town. And behind me, I have 300 guys with big swords. And we're just going to whoop your ass. And so that's how we're going to affect positive change around here. And everybody went, huh. Ah. Well, figuratively speaking, if we attempted to do that today, ram stuff down people's throat, what happens? People push back. So that takes a different approach. All right, long-winded soliloquy. But for all you arts people, that was a soliloquy. Um, <laughs> I don't know, random. That was very random, wasn't it, Sonia? Sonia's like, that was random. Yes, it was. Quite random, in fact. Hey, what else did you take away from our, our, uh, our time together? Anybody? What else did you take away from our time together? Or our three weeks, that three weeks. What else did you take away from the three weeks? The What's that? The okay, so talk to me about that. Wow. How many of you are impressed? <laughs> Very impressive. So I sent out the link to everybody and started to get responses within minutes because people had the time yeah. to do it immediately and got it out of the way. Um, I was surprised by a couple of the responses. Mm -hmm. um, the, one of the responses, for the majority of the trend, of course, was you're great, you're fabulous, whatever, right? And you, you almost think that they figured out that I might be able to tell who it was. <laughs> Me, right? right. But there was one that came back, and it, it hurt. Mm. It was like, really? That's how you see me? Mm. And it was like, you don't share information. You're a poor team player, and wow. I would send you to pay people still. Wow. I was like, who is this person? Like, I wanted to know who it was. That was the problem with being anonymous. Like, I need to go talk to this person. Mm -hmm. That's not the trend. That was one out of the ten responses. Right. Right. So it took a while, but I'm hoping that I've worked the change into my behavior and that they're seeing me better. So I am trying to make sure that I'm communicating better. If I'm doing something, I'm sharing information right away and, and making sure 
to include the appropriate people because perhaps they just felt left out that day. But hmm. I've done something and left them out and it hurt them. So that was the response to me. But it was the one thing that just, it hurt immediately. Mm-hmm. I wanted to go solve the problem right now. Mm-hmm. It was interesting to see some of the other responses. People were telling me to go and take a drama class and come where I could just be creative and hmm. stuff like that. So there was a lot of good feedback. Was it a va- what do you feel like it was a valuable use of your time? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think it's something you would do again? I actually had spoke with my supervisor. We do a yearly assessment of everything, and I said I would like to do that again. Come my come time for that mm-hmm. assessment, because I'd like to send it to the same group of people mm-hmm. and get that feedback. Perfect. And be able to include that with just my career development. I, I would I would just say that at least in my own professional experience, when 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 we had 1,100 employees, I sent all 1,100 employees evaluated me once a year. My direct reports evaluated me every 90 days, and they they knew that they had the opportunity to tell me what they thought, and it made me giving them feedback a lot easier because they knew they were going to get to vent on me every 90 days. They were going to get to, if they wanted to blast me they, every 90 days, they were just going to get the opportunity. In other words, it, it ended up for me, not only was I getting good feedback, but it also was a nice release valve for staff because they knew they were going to be unfettered, right? Not held, they could, they could just say whatever the heck they want about the big boss. And you know what it did? It reduced stress in the workplace, I'm telling you, because it was, you know, any of you ever had that situation where you just want to say something, you just want to say something, you just want to say, and you know you can't? And it just, well, give them a release valve. So if you do it to gain feedback, or if you do it to build trust, or you do it as a release valve, by doing it on a regular basis, you, are, you just, in doing the activity, become the leader. Because people are going to say this, I would never do that. As soon as you get a person to say, I would never do that, in a positive way, They've acknowledged that you're leading. I wouldn't do something like that, let alone take the feedback and actually try to get better. Right? Very powerful. All right. Anybody else take the survey or send the survey out? Yes. Um, I thought mine was really funny. I sent it 12, and I sent it to various people that were about the same level, below, above. And mm-hmm. I sent it to my mom. And I sent it to your mom? Yes. Okay. And Okay. Okay. So what does that tell you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it tells me. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I'm going to use that as an opportunity to say this, because you all know, because I warned you, uh, on Monday, you're going to get an email, and in that email, it's going to be a link, and in that link, you're going to tell me what you're going to start working on. So obviously, in your specific instance, well, that consistent thing probably gives you a strong indication on the commitment you should make, right? So let's be clear. Look at the sequence that we used. First, look back, right, the Leadership History Survey. Then send out a survey to everybody you know or people in your sphere of influence and get feedback from them on on your performance. Then, now pick out your one thing. What's the one thing you're going to get better at? And remember that we asked you to write down people's names whose lives would improve if you got better at something. Hopefully, those were some of the people that you sent the survey to. See, it's one thing to say, I need to get better at... It's another thing to say to the people close to you, what do you prioritize that I should put my energy to get better at? It's philosophically, who's driving the process now? They're driving the process. And in a, a, I think, a a very tangible way, 
It's how we engage people. So you're using yourself, but it's a, it could be used in anything that you do. Anybody else? Something that you took away from the three weeks, and then we'll get flying on this week. Yes? No, no problems. We all looked at you and said, he's a stranger, but we, you know, we went with it. <laughs> Yeah. And I've been reading the, the handbook every week. In one of the videos you had mentioned, take the opportunity to reach out to someone who's made a positive impact. Yes, that's for question number nine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, to, and to thank them. So I, you know, over the course of my career, I've had a lot of wonderful leaders. And I've had a lot of leaders that maybe weren't so wonderful. Sure. At, at every stage of them, I've always been able to take something away. Mm -hmm. so there's something that they've done great that I want to inspire on. Or something that I've learned and never do that again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a very, very uh, nice email back from that person in thanking me for taking the time to uh, acknowledge that, but also um, providing me with something I wasn't expecting, an opportunity to have him continue on to be my mentor. Oh, wow. And help me further my development and, and to be, wow. become the leader that I want to be someday. Wow. So that was unexpected. That was very unexpected. Isn't it funny? You made his day, his week, his month. And then he saw it as an opportunity to maybe rekindle a relationship. Hmm. You know, whether you send out the survey or whether you call a person or any of these exercises, what are you already starting to see the trend in these exercises? What's the trend you're seeing in these exercises? Whether it's listen like someone's going to die at midnight or any of the other exercises, tangible and intangible that you've been asked to do, what are you starting to see? Are you starting to see a trend, I guess? Is anybody seeing? What's that? It's, they're always focused on building relationship, either ones I've had in the past or whatever. Okay, what else? Yes? Reflection on yourself. It's certainly introspective. Absolutely. What else? Leadership. Yeah, I got a lead. Sending that email was leadership, right? You had to lead. It wasn't passive. It was proactive. I'm moving. I'm doing. What else? Absolutely building trust. Trust within yourself. Trust with others, and hopefully the exercises that we do have a redeeming value to you and to others. So they're not trite exercises, hopefully. Hopefully they have meaning and then they have purpose, and you can go, oh wow, that had some meaning. That survey clearly had meaning to you. That email and the response clearly had meaning to you. So if you're not having these kind of, oh wow, I didn't have that kind of an epiphany, or I didn't... You might want to look at the aggressiveness, the, the intentionality, the passion, or how you're approaching the exercise. Because clearly they are vehicles could, that could have a return on investment that would be significant in comparison to the time you put in. All right, we got to get moving on tonight. So what are we doing tonight? Tonight we're introducing the next competency. Let me preface it by saying, over the next three weeks I will give you more information than you possibly could assimilate in a three-week period. I mean, I have a question Go ahead. For the survey we did, yes. the question three where we're asking if you would make me go to a class, mm -hmm. like what's that reflect? Okay, so it's a it's another way of phrasing question number two. It's a it's a it's a whimsical way. So if, if in question number two they said, I think you need to be a better you need to be better at interpersonal relationships. And my suggestions are that you do X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C. And then in question number three, they said, and if you needed to go back to school, I suggest you take a class on listening. It clarifies question number two. So question number three is really about validating and asking in a whole other way question number two. Does that make sense to everybody? I, I'm, I'm seeking to better understand, but I'm doing it in such a way, it's like asking a follow-up question, like an interview might say, well, that was great. Now, now unpack that a little bit for me. So you're asking it in a whimsical way, if you will, and you should validate. If it's completely different, hmm, that's weird. Why would it be completely different? And if you, as she did, see a consistent trend, and then you see the consistent trend on the class you should take, you're validating. Because one thing that we can't do is, or that I recommend that we not do, is 
take the one piece of feedback and run with it, good or bad. So that third question helps you validate the suggestion in the previous question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So we're moving now to a, a three-week period where I'm going to provide you more information than you possibly could assimilate in the three-week period. Because every one of you have come to this for different purposes. Some of you came to this because you're looking for leadership skills within a workplace. Some of you came to this because you're looking for leadership skills on a community level. Maybe you want to learn how to recruit volunteers or raise more money or whatever for your charity, for your volunteer activity. Others of you came here because I got to be a better leader of people. I want a promotion in my organization, whether that's a business or a volunteer organization or whatever. So each one of you came to this for different purposes, and it's a good mix. So in an attempt to make sure you get what you wanted, I'm going to put out information that some of it's going to relate to the workplace, some of it's going to relate to community, and then you're going to have to pick what's most relevant to you. It'll all make a little bit more sense in a moment, but I'm just prefacing by saying there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to talk about in the next few weeks, and you won't possibly be able to assimilate it all. There is no way. So don't even try. Just focus, on, just focus on why you're here and then pick out the information that will help you the most with that. Okay, now let's get into the next three weeks. The next competency is a proactive, big picture systems thinking. Now, to be able to explain it, I got to set it up. I got to do a little setup first. In my life, I've always been in positions and in opportunities that were well beyond my capacity. I got promoted too early, or I was given an opportunity too early, or I had a chance to do something too early. Beyond my skill, beyond my knowledge, beyond my talent, beyond my education, every single one. And in most of them, it was some kind of urgent situation, like a battlefield promotion. You're in charge. I have no idea what to do. You're in charge. Oh my God. Every, every single time. Every single time. And through that experience, I had to find a way to win. I, I, I either need to figure it out because people were counting on me, or I was going to crash and burn. And life just kind of set me up like that. In one of those situations, I went from supervising a small group of people to literally in one day to 750 people in one day. Everybody that reported to me had been in the business longer than I had been alive. That is not an exaggeration. They had all been in the business longer than I had been alive. I was 26 years old. 20, yeah, 26 and a half years old, and I was supervising 750 people. Under my purview was 750 people, 40 some odd direct reports. They're all older than me. And most of them knew you shouldn't be in this job. <laughs> so not only have we been in the business longer than you, you have no business being in the job. And just because cause I worked for a family that owned a lot of stuff, and I got promoted to, run, to help run a hotel casino. You're in charge. You're the director of hotel operations. You've never gone to hotel school. You've never really worked in a hotel. And you have no formal education whatsoever. And just a year and a half ago, we remember you as the busboy in the grill and rotisserie restaurant. How in the hell did you get this job? How many of you have heard this before? <laughs> or maybe you've said this before. And here I am. I got all these people counting on me. And I would go home at night and cry because I knew I didn't belong in the job. I knew I didn't have what it took. Now, obviously, Mr. Carano saw something in me, a work ethic, something, I don't know. Or he was drunk. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> so uh, as a former athlete, I always turn to like motivational quotes to find some, uh, right, that thing. I'm going to go through the quotes. And I came across a quote of a guy named Archimedes. Now, Archimedes was a mathematician. Archimedes was a philosopher. Archimedes was one of the fathers of geometry. Archimedes uh, came up with the idea and the concept of the fulcrum and lever, right? You put the rock and you got the stick and you, mm, and you move the thing heavier than you. Or the compound pulley, right? You can use this pulley and do the work of five and six and eight men. One person can do it. That was Archimedes. And Archimedes said this. He said, give me a place to stand and I will move the world. I thought, wow, 
give me a place to stand and I will move the world. What does that really mean? That, mean? that means I can do anything and I can overcome and I can achieve. And Yeah! I can do this! Because <laughs> give me a place to stand. And I didn't know who Archimedes was because I'm dumb as a rock. So I kind of, back then, you know, there's no Google, so you're going to the encyclopedia, you know. You know. How many remember encyclopedias? <laughs> Side note, when I was 11 years old, I walked out and there was a big there was a Christmas tree and there was this huge box. Seriously, the biggest box I've ever seen in my life. And I was a little kid. I was like, oh my God, this is going to be the best Christmas in the history of my life. So I ripped open the paper. And it said Encyclopedia Britannica. And I went just like this. No, it can't be. It can't be. <laughs> and so I ripped open the box. And there was all these freaking books. And I looked at my family and I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? I can't read. I haven't passed a class. What is wrong with you? I digress. Anyways, back to the subject. So I went and looked up this Archimedes, and I was like, wow. What was the context of what he was saying? Because what I came to find was he wasn't a motivational quote. It was a statement of fact. If you give me a fulcrum, and if you give me a lever big enough, I can move just about anything. So just give me a place to stand because I'll bring my fulcrum and lever and I can handle it. Hmm, I thought to myself, what is he really saying to me? Because I really thought he was talking to me. And what I thought he was saying to me was, if you have a system that's built for the occasion, you can do just about anything. And that began my journey on systems thinking. Force multiplying systems thinking. I then read the the writings of Senge and others. And what I came to realize is that the whole world we live in is a system. You're not getting it, so let me unpack it a little bit more for you. Hasn't it ever blown you away that that thing way up in the sky, burning like fire, if it moved one centimeter that way or one centimeter this way, it would completely and fundamentally change our lives? And yet it's not connected by wires or anything. It's called the solar system. Or that thing at night that's up in the sky controls the water and how it flows, ebbs and flows in our oceans. Doesn't that kind of blow you away? It's connected, but it's not really connected. That's because it's a system. How about your body? Do you have to think about your heart beating? Do you have to think it? Do you have to be like, beat now, beat now, <laughs> beat now? No, you don't have to do that. It just beats. It's a system. It's a phenomenal system that they say if you take pretty good care of it, it'll last a long time. Or how about that thermostat on the wall? That, that that is connected to something up here, and if I move that little thing, something happens? Let me make it even deeper for you. How about social systems? Doesn't it blow you away that there's social systems at play? That we are, are imperceptible, but we see the results? I don't know. You know, I'm just so happy to be having this baby. My mom had me when she was 15, and her mom had her when she was 15, and here I am at 15. Or how about this? We're just doctors. My dad was a doctor. His dad was a doctor. I'm a doctor. We're just doctors. Systems. The 21st century will be ruled by systems thinkers. Why? Because there's not enough time, energy, or effort at your disposal to get done everything you need to get done. And there are systems in play. So originally it was out of self-preservation. And then I came to the conclusion this whole thing is a system. First of all, can you recognize that there are systems in play? And then second of all, could you create systems to make the objective or get the outcome that you'd like? You see, systems happen in two ways. They either organically grow up and take hold. What does that sound like? I don't know. It's just what we do around here. Cowboy. I don't know. It's just what we do around here, right? I don't know. It's just what we do. And whether that's in a neighborhood, I don't know. That's just what we do in Fort McMurray. Or out in the patch, I don't know. That's just what we do. How many of you ever brought a new employee on board? Talk to them about the stated policy. And then when you walk away, all the employees say, well, that's great, but let me tell you what we do around here. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? That's a system. Or we intentionally create systems for a specific purpose or outcome. The challenge with that is, are they still relevant? Are they still meaningful? Is the purpose that we set them up for even still exist? What's a system? A system is an integrated set of parts that are deeply integrated for a specific purpose or outcome. I'll use this example. 
How many of you are completely satisfied with the youth that we're turning out today? Raise your hand if you're completely satisfied with the youth of today. Yeah. How many of you say we could probably do a little bit better job of equipping, preparing our young people to take on the 21st century? How many of you would agree with that comment? Okay, let me ask you this. What kind of a system do we have? Do we have a list of attributes we'd like to see from those 21st century citizens? Do we have all the youth-serving organizations, educational, recreational, faith-based, and the like, organized on developing each one of those characteristics in some kind of deeply integrated set of parts for a specific outcome? And then we complain that we don't get the result that we want. How about newcomers that come to Fort McMurray? Do we have some integrated way that all of the social service systems, all of the businesses, all of us work to helping that newcomer feel a part of the community and then make them a tax-paying, responsible, productive citizen? Do we have that, yes or no? no? No, because we don't have a system. The system sucks. The people aren't bad. The system sucks because it has organically grown up and taken hold. Now, here's the funny thing. How do we solve most human problems? We take a sliver of the system and we try to solve that little sliver. So if we're gonna win, we gotta be holistic thinkers, looking at the big picture. A pile of rocks is not a system. If I pull out the pile, the rock, I still got a pile of rock. But an engine is a system. Pull out the carburetor and what happens to the engine? Stops working. If any part of the system is misaligned or weakened, what are you gonna have? Failure. If I can get you to be a deeper, better systems thinker, you'll start to see the systems, both tangible and intangible, that are at play in your society. And then you'll start tinkering with them and playing with them. And then eventually, you'll create a better system. That's what Archimedes was saying. Think about it, guys. He freaking pulled in a boat, a boat that it took 10 men. And somehow he pulled it in because he had a good system. Here, let me make it clear, delegation. Do you have a system for delegation? Can you take another human being, explain to them what they're supposed to do, what you're supposed to do, and what's in between? So that there's not this, well, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. Or how about this, why the hell aren't you doing that? Or how about this, I can't believe they won't let me just go do that. Right? Delegation. How about this, do you know how to motivate another human being? Do you know how to move another human being, Nicole, into action? Do you have a system for that? How about this, your time? The number one commodity you have in life, 168 hours in a week, do you have an effective, efficient system to maximize that perishable commodity? The answer from most leaders is this, no. Write this down, force multipliers. A force multiplier. A quality system is a force multiplier. What do you think I mean by force multiplier? What do I mean by force multiplier? Come on, think. Yep. How about this? I, this is a completely inappropriate example, but it, it is, but it is a clear example. A sniper is a force multiplier because he's highly trained, highly skilled. Most nations, top snipers, can do the work of 12 soldiers because he's that skilled. One bullet, whereas somebody might fire 50 bullets. Now, I know that's a grotesque example, but it's so overt that it makes sense. Force multiplier. An effective system for delegation is a force multiplier. I can do more with less. A phenomenal system for maximizing the utilization of your time, force multiplier. An effective recruitment tool for a nonprofit, force multiplier. An effective strategy for fund development and raising money, force multiplier. So do you have force multipliers at your disposal? I don't understand. Damn it, the freaking fulcrum and lever is a force multiplier. All of a sudden, Archimedes, an 80-year-old man, can move a 500-pound rock. And that's what dawned on me in the middle of the night, crying that I couldn't do the job. I can do the job. I just need the force multiplier that's appropriate for the time. So now, all of a sudden, it was freeing. Now, all of a sudden, it wasn't pixie dust sprinkled on my head that made me a great leader. I could learn how to be a great leader if I saw the systems that were in play, if I could create systems, which is just taking all the various parts and deeply integrating them for a specific purpose. All of a sudden, I could do stuff if I had the right system.
So from then on, I just started thinking systems, 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 systems. Now, be clear, systems may be linear and sequential, but they're not necessarily systematic. It's not just systematic thinking. It's understanding that you and I are connected even though we're not connected. It's understanding that your life does impact mine even though we never see each other on a regular basis, just once every three weeks for an hour and 45 minutes. It's that your life does directly impact mine and mine does directly impact yours. That there are intangible systems at play in communities. I went and lived on the street as a homeless man. In 1998, I went and lived on the street as a homeless man. I went undercover and lived on the street as a homeless man because I wanted to see the system that was in play in the community that I was in. And then we wrote a series of front page articles. And then shortly after that, we opened up an elementary school for homeless families. And you know what I found out? We were never going to solve the homeless problem. You know why? There was a whole economic system around it. There's a whole economic system around it. People were benefiting from people being homeless. All the guys that sold the rot gut liquor and all of those cheap stores were benefiting. All of the people that rented a room for a day or a week and then locked people out so they couldn't get back to their stuff till they went and stole something to pay. There was a whole economic system that was against solving the problem. Does that make sense? Systems. And you know what? No difference in downtown Toronto. So it's not just that it was this community in the States. No difference. Do you see the systems that are played? They could be as simple as this. How about this system? You know what? Hopefully nobody in this room is called Jenny. You know, Jenny's kind of a bitch. Yeah, I know. I think so too. Yeah, you know what? I don't really like Jenny. Yeah, neither do I. And the next thing you know, a little system, a little clique has formed around Jenny being a bee. And I'm the supervisor and I can't figure out why nobody's working together. Well, that's because a little organic system has started to rise up and take hold. Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? If you're a systems thinker, you see it. Because here's how we'll try to solve it. We'll try to solve a sliver of that instead of seeing the holistic big picture issue. Would you agree with me that many, many leaders, both federal, provincial, and local, approach solving problems in slivers? and we never solve the system problem. Yes or no? Okay, you're not going to be that. Can you imagine if we can get 800 systems thinkers dumping, dumping out into Fort McMurray and the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo who are approaching from a system standpoint? We should be able to do it cheaper. We should be able to do it more effectively. We should be able to do it more efficiently. And we should be able to build a, a stronger community. Or within a business. Within a business, it's all about systems. Productivity, efficiency, effectiveness, profitability is all about systems thinking. There's not enough time, energy, or effort for you to get done what you want to get done in your life. There's just not, en there's not enough. How many? There's not enough. So, I better have great systems. I better have force multipliers. A bicycle is a force multiplier. I can go 30 and 40 miles an hour under my own capacity. I could never go that fast but I've got a mechanical human interface. Systems are tangible, systems are intangible. So over the next three weeks, here's what I'm gonna try to do. I'm gonna throw a bunch of systems at you. Time management, delegation, motivation, volunteer recruitment, and on and on and on. You're gonna have to pick the ones that are most relevant to you and that you think would equip your toolkit for where you're at. If I'm on the nonprofit voluntary sector side, board member, paid staff, volunteer, I might grab the stuff that relates to that. If I'm trying to supervise other people, I might grab the stuff that relates to that. If I'm just trying to lead myself, I might grab the stuff that relates to that. I don't care which one you really tap into. I just want you to use them as an examples of systems thinking. Has anybody ever heard this kind of conversation before? Raise your hand if you've heard Senge's work and others. Anybody? Good. I can say whatever I want and you'll just believe me. Anyways. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. I love it. <laughs> All right. Quick. We got to take this self-survey. Okay. So now, so now you're on this page. You're on the next page, right? So now, like we always do, we take the self-survey. Let's see where you line up. 
Okay, I'll just read them. So what's the competency? Big picture, holistic system thinker. Today's leader utilizes a proactive, very important, systems thinking, holistic approach to getting things done. Not all do it all myself approach. Proactive, holistic, big picture systems approach. I'm just going to read them randomly. You. One, totally not like that. Ten, I'm totally like that. I'll just read them randomly. When you're done, look up. I, that way I know you're completed. I understand there's a symbiotic relationship between human beings. I can apply strategies for learning about a group, a stakeholder, uh, key stakeholders, its resources. I demonstrate knowledge of social capital, organizational and community assets, and physical, human, financial, and environmental capital. I have a technique for generating a great idea. Do you have a way you generate a great idea? Or you just sit there and go like this. Where's an idea? I know people like that, right? It is. I know that sounds like something else. But anyways, I'm aware of my community's culture or DNA. I can facilitate the development of teams. I understand how to create organizational culture. I have a system for effective delegation. I have a system for powerful communication to powerfully communicate a message. I have a system for the recruitment of volunteers. I have a system for fund development. So just go through, just go through, just go through. Score yourself. Yes. Thousands of people pretend they were pregnant with an idea. All right. And then we all had to like foster this idea, nurture it inside really? of us. And then we all had to give birth at the same time. So it was like 10,000 women pretty much screaming, screaming? Giving birth to this creative idea. <laughs> ah! It and it crazy. sounded like that. Yeah. Just 10,000 more. Yeah, that's funny. That is funny. I love Oprah. I love Oprah. It was, it was TJ Bishop. TJ Jakes. Oh, TJ Jakes? Yeah. Oh, he's good. No, he's good, that guy. That guy can bring it. Yeah. Well, he's very... T.D. Jakes, Oprah. Oh, and Deepak Chopra. How much was that ticket? Really? That's not bad for those guys. Well, how, but how about this? You get me for free. So old Oprah can kiss my... Okay, I just got that to say. And I came here to you. So, yeah, how about those guys? All right, here we go. Hopefully you're done taking the survey. Let's move because we got 45 minutes, 40 some odd minutes to rock and roll. Okay. So what does this do? Remember the self-survey. It helps you focus your learning. You only have so much time for education over the next three weeks. Anything that's, you know, six and below, you're paying attention. I got to put some energy into that. So if you only have an hour left, you're looking for the things that are you know, five and six and below. So what's my point in this opening salvo, this opening you know, pontification? It's this. Take heart. It's not about talent. It's not about ability. It's not about capacity. It's about choice. I know I can do anything. Oh, I can't do everything, but I know I can do anything. And that is not because I'm a stud or a superstar or anything. You can do anything because you can choose the system you apply. You can build the right system and you can apply it. So all of a sudden, is it about me being brilliant? No, it's just about me understanding how to align some parts together that seem logical when deeply integrated to achieve a certain outcome. Hmm, I could do that. I could pull that off. And that was the realization I came to and I stopped crying. And I realized I was in control, that all I had to do was build some great systems. And you know what? In the first year, we had a million dollar turnaround, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but that division had never turned a profit in the history of the company. Because in the casino business, you give things away, right? So it never turned a profit. The quarters before, the quarters before, lost 3 million, lost 2.5 million. A quarter, right? 5 million lost, 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 lost. And we had a million dollar profit. So really the net turnaround was, you know, eight, nine million in 90 days. 
because we just went systems, 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 having nothing to do with me. The talent was already there. We just started organizing and funneling it around some systems thinking. So the power of choice, picking the right system, should give you significant sense of freedom and that you have capacity and should equal success in changing times. So what we're going to try to do in the coming days over the next three weeks is give you some systems. We'll begin that discussion tonight. Some very specific systems. Each, you'll notice on the website, and I'll tell you in the emails, hey, there's a system of delegation up there. If you need to be a more effective delegator, go watch the 15-minute video. Hey, you need, you know, da 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 One that we're all going to do is time. We'll talk about it tonight. For every day next week, you're going to get an email around time. They'll be short, they'll be to the point, but you're going to get an email. Because all of us, every one of us, needs to have a better system for time. Not time management, but maximizing the utilization of our time. It's a perishable commodity, and it's the one thing that winners and losers have in common. 60 seconds to a minute, 60 minutes to an hour, 24 hours in a day, and 168 hours in a week. Every one of us in this room has that. If, if you could squeeze out of your life four more hours a week, would that be okay with you? How about 16 more hours a month? Would that be okay with you? Yeah, hopefully the system that we'll lay down will help you do that so that you can, in turn, spend more time with your kid, more time with your spouse, more time volunteering, more time for yourself. Yes. Yeah, yeah, online, whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it says, in the amount of time that people spend on Facebook, all of North America spends on Facebook in one day, you could build like 500 <laughs> Empire State. That's right. And one of the, the exercise I'm going to give you next Friday <laughs> is for the following week to track your time. And let's see where your time really goes. But for now, just know we're going to throw a lot of systems at you. You pick the ones that you think are the most relevant to you. But time, we're all doing. We're all doing. Okay? Fair enough? Okay. The ones that we're going to identify. How do I come up with a good idea? We'll talk about that in a moment. Maximizing utilization of your time. Motivation, which if we have time, we'll get to, if we have the time, we'll get to that tonight. If not, there will be a video on a system. And you have it. Where's your handout? Somebody got it? Who's got the, the little green sheet? Yeah. Take that out real quick. I'm going to walk you through a system to motivate another human being. How do I move another human being into action? And you notice that it's diagram based. Why is it diagram based? So that even if you're the, most in, the least inspirational, least motivating human being in the world, you could still learn how to move another human being into action. Because it's not about being a good talker. Motivation is not about being a good talker. It's about being able to build a trusting relationship help people see their potential, and then support them as they move towards their potential. That's motivation today. So we'll talk about that, okay? And then finally, you'll notice this long list, volunteer recruitment, fund development, powerful communication, effective delegation. All of that, by the time we get to the end of three weeks, all of that will be on the website in the form of teaching videos. And you'll just pick the ones that make the most sense to you. They range anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. And you're just going to have to pick the ones that make most sense to you. Fair enough? Okay, let's do the first one right now, because I think it starts, it, 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 it's important to start with our minds. See, I was, well, let me ask it this way. How many of you get frustrated because you never come up with a great idea? Anybody ever get frustrated like that? In other words, you see other people, that you're sitting in a meeting, and, and everybody's like talking at the table and brainstorming, and all of a sudden, somebody throws out this brilliant idea. And everybody goes, oh, man, great idea. And you're like, <laughs> kind of like Homer Simpson, you know, Ooh. well, that was me. Like every single meeting, never a great idea, never a great idea, never a great idea, never a great idea. And I finally was like, this sucks. And I hate everybody that comes up with good ideas. They <laughs> suck too. And then I said to myself, this can't be magical, man. It can't be that all of a sudden you just, like you're born innovative can't be. There's got to be a way that I could learn to be innovative. 
So started looking and looking and looking and looking and looking and came across the work of Dr. Ludwig. And Dr. Ludwig at the University of Texas, he basically said that it's about your sequence of thinking. Hmm, sequence of thinking, systems, hmm. And then I started to read other research that said that the patterns that we think in, we do repeatedly, like when we see a problem. We probably problem solve it in the same sequence. We think this, and when we think that, and we think this, and we think that. And the research indicated, and maybe you've heard this before, that those sequences become so routine that they actually become grooves in your brain. Has anybody ever heard that? That I problem solve, you've heard that. I problem solve the same way. I look at opportunity the same way. And it just grooves. The synapses and the chemicals fire the same way over and over again. And that's why I don't come up with a good idea. Because I approach it the same way. Huh. Never thought about that. So then Dr. Ludwig said this. He said that the typical planning process sounded something like this. That when we sit down to brainstorm, we probably ask questions something like the following. Well, what do we have to start with? We have this. Well, where do we want to go? We want to go there. Well, okay. What kind of steps could we take? We could take these. How much money would that cost? This. How many agree with me? That's basically a brainstorming session. Where are we at now? What do we have now? How much money do we have? How much time do we have? How much people do we have? How much do we have now? Okay, how could we use it a little bit differently than we've had before? It's usually something like this. Well, it's 1 plus 2. You heard me do this before. 3 plus 4. That equals 10. Okay, let's put the 2. Let's put the 3. Let's put the 1. Let's put the 4. And everybody's doing this. Great idea. That was a great meeting. Good job, man. You're, a, you're an amazing thinker. Oh, that was, that was awesome. But one of you goes, holy shit, guys. That's still 10. But because everybody's high-fiving, you don't say that out loud. You're like... Oh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> How many of you have sat in that meeting? Why? Because there's no innovation to rearranging things. So here's what Ludwig said. Ludwig said, mm, resource-based planning, in other words, taking what I have now kind of planning, money, time, energy, effort, people, whatever, is always going to defend the status quo. Always. Because it takes into account what? what I have existing. And if I take into account what I have existing, the likelihood of coming up with an innovative idea is what? Minimal at best. The only way to come up with an innovative idea is to flip the process, he said. So he established a new sequence of thinking. The sequence of thinking I'm about to review with you, I put on a three by five card and took with me to every meeting for a year pushing my thinking sequence through this sequence and questioning. Ironically, a year later, the World Leisure Congress said that Let Them Be Kids, our initiative, was one of the four most innovative social programs in the world. How many say that's a pretty big award? It is. Is it because we're brilliant? No, it was because of this pattern of thinking. Okay, let's walk through it. Now, remember the goal here is, how do I come up with innovative ideas? Do I have a system to come up with an innovative idea? Well, does it guarantee an innovative idea every time? Yes or no? No, but this sequence will lead you to more innovative ideas. Somebody close that door back there, please. Number one, what do I want it to be? What do I want it to be? So you say to me, Ian, that's outcome-based thinking. You're absolutely right. That's Covey. Begin with the end in mind. You're absolutely right. There's nothing new under the sun. How many of you know nothing new under the sun? Nothing new under the sun. It's just how we position it, how we say it. So you're always going to start with what I want it to be. I start here, not back here. What do I want it to be? Now here's a little nuance to it that might be unique for me. Might be unique to you as well. What does it look like, smell like, feel like, taste like? Why am I challenging you to be able to articulate those descriptors of what I want it to be? Why, what does it smell like, look like, feel like, taste like? Obviously, those are metaphorical. Why am I thinking and challenging you to be able to explain it in that depth? Why do we want to be able to explain what it smells like, the outcome smells like, looks like, feels like, tastes like? What's that? So it's clear to who? 
and? Right. So write this down. People get engaged by why, not how. Think about it. You've sat in meetings where all the how is discussed, the how is discussed, the how is discussed, and your eyes go like this. But as soon as people start talking about why we're doing that, what we hope to achieve, what will the impact be, you start getting excited, you start getting energized, you start getting fired up. How did King get a million people to show up? Was he at, at the March on Washington? Was he talking about hows or whys? How did, how did Mandela mobilize a nation? Talking about hows or whys? So the reason I say to you, be able to articulate it, what does it look like, smell like, feel like, taste like, is so that you can engage people's hearts and minds. And, as she was quick to point out, it's clear for me as well. So step number one, what do I want it to be? So remember, this is a planning sequence of thinking. Step number two, where is it at today? Is it at today? Now, next to that, write this, courageous conversation. How many of you agree with me that when you read the blog or you read the paper or you listen to the radio, there's a lot of talk about stuff in Fort McMurray or the region of Buffalo. But how many of you agree with me, oftentimes it's not about the stuff that you know in your heart should be talked about. Raise your hand if you agree with that. That's because no one's having courageous conversations. Like in your workplace. You ever sat in a meeting and we talk around the problem? And everybody knows in their heart what we really should be spending the hour talking about. But no one's willing to have a courageous conversation. Or how about in the country? We spend a lot of time talking about a lot of things, but how many of you know we need to have some courageous conversations? What do you think a courageous conversation is? What's a courageous conversation? What do you think I mean by that? It's courageous, yes. It's a conversation that takes everybody out of their comfort zone. Yeah. It might be a little uncomfortable, but why is it uncomfortable? Because we're being offensive, we're being mean? Well, I don't know if we're being offensive or mean, but certainly we're talking about what really matters. Here's the other caveat. Go ahead. It could be like something, like admitting that you don't know what to do. Could be. So you're, 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 you're saying we're not sure, which can be uncomfortable. How about this? How about a conversation where we only talk about what really matters and don't look to blame anybody? A courageous conversation is where I'm just trying to solve the problem, not have a conversation to assign blame. How many of you agree with me? So many of our political conversations, so many of our big picture conversations are only an attempt to assign blame to somebody. Raise your hand if you concur. That's why we don't get things done, because we're not trying to solve the problem. We're just trying to figure out who to pin it on. So a courageous conversation as a leader is where I sit down with the three of you and go, you know what, I don't care who got us here. The only reason we're going to talk about how we got here is in the context of trying to figure out how to get the hell out of here. So I'm not trying to assign blame to anybody. We're not going to point fingers anyway. I need to talk about what's really going on. Why is it so critical when trying to come up with an innovative idea to have a conversation about what's really going on? Yes? Because otherwise you're just going to maintain the status That's right. Exactly. Admiral Yamamoto, I may have said this to you before, why did Admiral, Admiral Yamamoto lose the Pacific battle? Because he had less ships, less skill, lack of information. Nobody would have a courageous conversation with the Admiral, Admiral Yamamoto. Nobody would sit down. It was both cultural and hierarchical. No one would look at it, Admiral, Admiral Yamamoto and go, you're wrong. <laughs> That's, it's not like you think, Admiral. And so what happened? He lost. Well, I mean, thankfully for the Allied forces, he lost. And probably all of us, thankfully, he lost. But it wasn't because they had less talent, less ability, less resources. It was because they had a lack of information and no courageous conversations. So what is a courageous conversation? I only talk about what matters. I do not seek to, I do not seek to find blame. I'm only talking about the past if it's relevant to building a better future. And I speak an open mind. Now, in a workplace, what does it look like? Now, some people call it a safe zone. Come on, we're going to have a safe zone conversation. <laughs> right? 
That's, what's that? That's right. We're all going to share the talking stick. Here we go. Pass the talking stick around. So whatever little game you want to play, I don't care. Just make sure you create an environment where everybody can share their perspective. We're not attacking. We're not placing blame. And this is, a, this is the final caveat, that we openly disclose our biases before the conversation begins. I sit down with these three ladies and I say, you know what? I got to tell you, walking into this thing, here's where I stand. And I don't think I'm going to be changing that very often. Can you imagine if everybody just shared their biases before the conversation began? And remember, we're not trying to seek blame. We're just going to be open about where we all stand. Do you think you'd have a more effective conversation? Why does this not happen? Fear. Right. Lack of what? Trust. trust. So now do you see the sequence of this? Why is it so important that I build trusting relationships with people of influence? So then I can have some courageous conversations which will lead to innovative ideas. Because unless we really talk about what's going on and what really matters, we'll never come up with an innovative idea. We'll just defend the status quo, right? So sequentially it builds. I've built a trusting relationship with you so you know that when I start talking about things that might be offensive, I'm not trying to offend. I'm just talking about what's really going on. And you know me well enough to know my heart because I've taken the time to build a relationship with you. So you know I'm not trying to attack you or blame you or tear you down or gain some advantage over you. And so you start to talk openly and honestly, revealing your biases so that we can come to a place where we can actually have a conversation about the crap that matters and solve the damn thing. How many of you would like to have those kind of conversations? But what comes first? The trust. So don't go try to do this. Before you do that, you're just piss everybody off. And how many of you have seen that happen in the workplace? The boss comes in. Okay, everybody sit down. And he says, you know, we've got some problems going on around here. And I, I just want to talk it out. Let's, let's, we're going to talk it out. And we're going to write them on little white pieces of paper. And we're going to put it around the room. And, and we're just going to all talk it out, okay? Okay. Hand the walking stick, please. Or the talking stick around, yes. And then all of you go like this. Uh, this guy's drunk. I'm not saying a freaking word. Because I know I'm going to get blasted. Or I know it's going to be held against me. Or I know someday I'm gonna get back, someone's going to get back at me. And so you shut your mouth. Am I right or wrong? Mm -hmm. So don't do this part until you do the first part, which is the trust building. Okay, so step number one, what do I want it to be? Step number two, where is it at today? Courageous conversation. Step number three, this is way, Anthony Robbins and Ted Talk ain't talking about this. I guarantee you that. What attitudes would have to be shifted to take me from where I'm at to what I could become, or what it could become. What attitudes stand in the way? What attitudes stand in the way? Why do I immediately go to attitudes before action steps? So you would think, well, wait a minute, isn't the next logical thing to talk about the action steps to get me from where I'm at to what I could become? Why is it attitudes, attitudinal barriers before action steps? Yes. Perfect. So if I can add, uh, how many of you agree with me? The greatest idea in the world can come rolling down. If all the people go like this, oh, no, you didn't. Right? If the attitudes aren't in alignment with the plan, forget about the innovation even happening. So I must address attitudinal barriers first because they will prevent the innovation from happening. Give me some examples of attitudinal barriers. Give me some examples. I'm going to make James work a little bit here. Meow. 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 It's looking like, Ugh. okay, yes, give me an example. That's not my job. Okay, that's my job is an attitudinal barrier. That's not my job. Yeah, that's, that's not my job is an attitudinal barrier, right? That's not my responsibility. Attitudinal barrier, yes. Okay, that's, yeah, that's time to fire the attitudinal barrier. Okay, somebody else. Attitudinal barrier. What's that? 
That'll never work. Now on that one, that'll never work, it's not my job, are somewhat combined. And I'll talk about them in a second. Go ahead. Um, I don't like you, so everything you say is wrong. That's right. I am against you because the idea came out of your mouth. When we get to the engagement approach to planning, I will teach you how to hold a brainstorming session that is actually effective. I call it tapping into the collective intelligence. And we will teach you a way to get around that. To get around that barrier. Okay, somebody else. What's an attitudinal barrier? That's right. That's an attitudinal barrier. Go ahead. I don't trust you. I don't trust attitudinal barrier. Is this an attitudinal barrier? Is this an attitudinal barrier? <laughs> right? Attitudinal barriers. I can't come up with a creative idea without addressing potential attitudinal barriers. Ian, it's about money. We don't have enough resources. Let me ask you a question. In Fort McMurray or in the regional municipality of Wood Buffalo, if the right seven attitudes got in alignment about your thing, would you have enough money? <laughs> so then is it about money or is it about attitudinal shift? It's about going and building trusting relationships with people of influence and shifting their attitude towards what you want to do. Every project that we've ever done, we've never had any money. Never had any money. We had to go out and get it. We had to go out and convince people that what we're doing was relevant and meaningful. And we did it by building a trusting relationship, shifting attitudes. Attitudes. What are the attitudinal barriers? Then I say this. What activities, what activities could I do to shift those attitudes. What activities could I do to shift those attitudes to where we're at today to what we could become? Activities come after I identify attitudinal barriers. And then, and only then, do I say this. What resources, resources would I need to do those activities, to shift those attitudes, to take me where I'm at to what we want to be? Why is resources the last thing? Why is resources the last thing? You can always gather resources. Yeah. It's always cheaper, too. When I start with what I have, I think I have to spend more. When I start with the outcome and then work my way backwards, I find that I end up spending less. I'll use an example. This program is the first of its kind. We don't know of any other municipality in the world that has done this in this way where they take a bunch of different people from a bunch of different backgrounds in a bunch of different areas of a region and teach them for free in a meaningful and robust way over a period of time with the only goal being you go out and make the community a better place. There's nobody else that's done that. And we had to market it. So last year in August and September, July, August and September, we had to market this thing. Now, what would be your initial thought of how we should market it? Just tell me, what, what do you think we should do? Call people. What else? Now, when I say market, I mean we were doing it here and we had to market it to Wood Buffalo and the citizens of Fort McMurray. How do you think would be the most, you know, the, the knee jerk of how we should market it? You have to market it to the right people who are of that influence in the region. Okay. And once they've bought into it, then they can spread the word to everyone else. Could be. Newspapers. Okay, newspaper. How many would say newspaper, radio, Facebook, Twitter? How many would say that? Yeah, emails. Emails. Fundamentally rejected all of that. Here's what we said. We're going to go meet people. We're going to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to go meet with the Somali Association. We're going to meet with the Filipino Association. We're going to meet with the, the Hindi Association. We're going to meet with the Islamic Association. We're going to meet with every single stakeholder group. Ross, how many meetings do we have? One-on-one. One-on-one. So that people saw the heart of it all. One-on-one. 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 One on one, one on one, one on one. Small group, three people, two people, one people, three people, two people, one people, three people, two people. It took a long time. How much did it cost? Only time. Only time. Time and some coffee. Some coffees here and there, <laughs> right? What was the impact? Well, we had 500 people, and we spent very little money. So we had to say to ourselves, what do we want it to be? We want a bunch of people from all kinds of different sectors who don't normally show up. So we don't want just the same players. I said this. This is what I told everybody in the meeting. I want to walk in the room and not see one face I've ever seen in Snap. <laughs> That's who I want in the first class. I don't want anybody's face that I've ever seen in Snap 
That's who I want in the room. And Ross, the majority of people, you, we, we had never seen that first time in Snap, right? Yeah. For the most part. The other is interesting thing that happened was uh, when we real, uh, reached out to people that had never been reached out to, they started, you know, the interest started building, and they told their friends in their community. That's right. We met with the, I met with the maids at the merit on their break. So you met with people one-on-one, one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Because what we wanted to be was a bunch of different people that had never been invited, a very diverse group. Where are we at today? They don't trust, they don't know, they don't like, they don't whatever. Misperception, so on and so forth. What are the attitudinal barriers? All those things that I just described. What's the only way to break that down? Go see them personally. How much money does that cost? A little bit of time and a little bit of coffee. Unique marketing strategy? Absolutely true. It's completely unique marketing strategy. Oh, okay, so it works with personal stuff, but how does it work with money stuff? It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. What do I want it to be? Where are we at now? What attitudes are preventing those resources from flowing to me? What activities could I do to remove those attitudinal barriers? Simple. So what you do, here's the practicality of it. You take this, you put it on the 3 by 5 card, and you take it to every meeting. You put it right there to force yourself to think in this sequence. And before you know it, it'll be a part of the 80% of your unconscious behavior, right? It'll become a habit. Now, how does it work in a group? You just do this. So, let me see, make sure I understand. What we're wanting the outcome to be is... And everybody's not used to thinking that way. What do you, what do you mean, outcome? Well, just what do we want it to be? Why are we doing this? We want it to be this. Oh, okay, that's I, okay, that makes sense now, yeah. Well, where do you think it's at now? I mean, what are really the, the, the facets, the, the attributes? You know, what, why is it is the way it is now? What happened? How did it get like this? Then everybody answers. And then you say, huh. Well, if we tried to change it, how do you think people would react? What do you think their, their emotion would be? What do you think their attitudes would be? Or what do you think the attitudes would be from stopping it from moving forward? How come it hasn't moved forward yet? What's preventing it? Answers. Huh. What do you think we could do to overcome that? And then finally, well, how much money do you think that would cost? That's a, a, a simple example of how you would facilitate the conversation without even being in control, and yet you're what? In control. Put it on the piece of paper, walk it out. All right, somebody tell me, what do you think? What do you think of this sequence? What does it make you think? Quick, 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 quick. We don't have a lot of time. That's right. Because no one's saying this. Why are we here right now? What do we really hope to accomplish? Mm -hmm. Somebody be clear to me on what we're trying to accomplish. Now, depending on the level of trust in the room, your position of authority, you can get away and less than that and all. But at least you can say this. I'm not exactly clear on what the desired outcome of this is. Somebody clarify it for me so I can give better input. What we're trying to accomplish is blank. Oh, okay. Hmm. And it seems to me that where we're at now is blah, 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 blah. Does everybody agree with that? Yep, that's how we see it. Hmm. Well, how do you think we're going to get from here to there? And what would be the attitudes that would prevent us? I mean, that's the simplicity of the talk. Mm -hmm. And you'll find that you'll start to have more efficient meetings. And someone's going to walk out and go like this to you. Good job. Finally, we had a meeting that did something. And who's now the leader? You are. Were you overt? Were you rude? Were you, ah, rah, 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 this sucks? No, you just ask some questions. And they're non-threatening questions, hopefully. You know your dynamic well enough to know if you can throw, how to throw it out there. You're savvy enough. And then you just move the ball down the field a little bit at a time. And somebody's going to walk out of the meeting and say to you, thank goodness, finally we had a meeting that actually developed a quality plan. And now you just became a person of influence. Make sense? Does this make sense? Okay, Ian, not any of you in the room, but some of you sitting at home, because all of them would be afraid to say it in front of me. I don't like your little plan. 
I don't like your little critical thinking, little diagram. I don't like it. It sucks. Well, that's fine. I'm okay with that. Because guess what? There's a thousand of these. Go to the internet and type in innovative thinking skills, creative thinking skills, critical thinking skills. You'll get 495,000 responses in 1.29 seconds. So I don't care if you don't like mine, but you better be able to explain to me as a leader how you come up with an innovative idea. Would you agree with me that our world is desperate for innovative ideas? Would you agree with me the person or persons that can either come up with on their own or facilitate a creative idea will have followers flocking to them minute by minute by minute, yes or no? So it's in your best interest to come up with a system to create an innovative idea. And why do, I, why do I challenge it to be an actual system, not just kind of your way? Why do I want it to be a system? What can you do with a system? I can teach it to others, which means I can create culture within an organization, a nonprofit, a group, or a community. Because as soon as I lay it out sequentially, I can teach it. And remember, what am I going to give? Silver and gold I might not have, but I'll give you a way to innovate. And this guy looks at me and goes, oh, I like that. That's really good, Ian. Thanks for sharing that with me. I'll use that in my division. I'll use that in my department. I'll use that with my group. And now all of a sudden I start to create organizational culture because it's not enough for me to know how to do it. That's the selfish leader that gives a rip about anybody else. The giving, caring, servant leader that we all desperately want says, I'll take what I have and I'll share it with you freely because I want to make your situation better. I want to make your meetings more productive. I want to make your environment more effective, more efficient, more profitable, more whatever. So it's not enough for you to know how to do it. You've got to be able to teach it because otherwise can you lead anybody? No. Just you. And I'll, you come to the end of yourself at some point. All right, turn the page. We've got a, about 20 minutes left. We're going to end on time tonight. Okay, I told you that next week we're going to have a week long and more. Actually, a, a first week is going to be a very overt week long discussion about time. And then we're going to do an exercise that will take a week, but it will be underneath the surface, if you will. Time. But before we have a conversation about time, we've got to kind of lay the foundation so we're all on the same page. I'm going to use the metaphor for the coming week of money. Money. Sonia, can you and I play a game? Sonia, can you and I... Okay. <laughs> Sonia looked at me like, you can kiss my ass. I ain't playing the game. Anymore. I'm tired. I got my McCafe. It's gone. And you're pontificating tonight, so come on, right? Can we play a game? Yes, we may. Okay, yes, we may. Okay, good. I'm going to take $86,000, and I'm going to put it into your bank account. All of a sudden, she perks up. She's like, hey. Can I play? That's right. Can I play? That's right. So, Sonia, here's the drill. I'm going to take $86,000, and I'm going to put it in your bank account. I knocked on your door. It's that guy from Leadership Boot Camp. How did he get our address? Sonia, I know you're in there. Open the door. You open the door. Sonia, I've come to talk to you today because I don't know if you knew this, but I'm a banker. And you're like, you're a banker. I am a banker. Well, what can I do for you, Ian? Sonia, I credited your bank account today, $86,000. Oh, really? How'd you get my bank account? <laughs> <laughs> And then I say to you, Sonia, but there'll be two stipulations. Stipulation number one, Sonia, I'll put that money in there at the beginning of the day. Hmm. And stipulation number two, at the end of the day, right before the clock strikes 12, anything left in the positive balance, I will debit from your account. So you have from the beginning of the day at 12.01 till the end of the day, 11.59, to do whatever you want with that $86,000. Now, Sonia, tomorrow you might, might get another $86,000, but it's not a guarantee. You just know you get $86,000 today, and you can spend it however you want. Want to put it into another bank account? Want to give it to charity? Want to spend it on you and your family? I don't care what you do with it. Just know this. At 11.59, I'm coming back. Anything left, I'm going to debit from your account. Sonia, what would you do with that money? Put it in another bank account. Mm. <laughs> Let me make it easy for you. Would you leave a dime in the account? No. 
How many of you concur you would not leave a dime in the account? Here's the funny thing. You get $86,000 every day. You see, there's 86,400 seconds in a day. They're given to you as a gift to spend however you want. It's a perishable commodity. Tomorrow you might get another $86,000. But like Sonia, any of that 86,400 seconds that you haven't used to better yourself, better your community, better your family, better your fellow man, is what at the end of the night? Gone forever. I think it's the number one commodity you have at your disposal. Do you know how to maximize it? Why do I keep using the term all night of maximizing? Maximizing time. Why am I using it? Think in the term of a money metaphor. Why am I using maximize? Yes? Exactly. I don't want to manage my money. Anybody that ever, if you ever get rich, listen to me. If you ever get rich and someone comes to you and says, let me manage your money, say, get the hell out. I don't need anybody to manage my money. I need someone to do what with my money? Grow my money. Maximize my money. That's what I need. I need someone to take what little money I got and blow it up big. If you just want to manage my money, go talk to somebody else. Time is the exact same way. So, over next week, the whole week, we're going to talk about how to take the 86,400 seconds you've been given every day and maximize their utilization. But before we can do that, we've got to talk about some basic principles so that the conversation makes sense. The first basic principle, time is a perishable commodity. When, when, when Sonia lays her head down on the pillow tonight, and I lay my head down on the pillow tonight, anything that I didn't use today worth a damn is gone. You're not getting it back, period. That's why it's so sad to me to watch a kid sit and play a video game for hours upon hours upon hours. He's not getting that back. That's why to sit and aimlessly attack Facebook with a fervor and energy rarely known to man, rather than using it to better my fellow man, is sad. That doesn't mean you can't have recreation. That doesn't mean you can't have fun. That just means I only got freaking 86,000 of it. And it's ticking and going away. If you were to call my staff tomorrow morning and say, I want to talk to Ian, here's exactly what they'll say to you. Why? What's the point? What's your desired outcome? Mr. Hill only has a certain amount of time. And he's going to want to know why you want to meet. Now, do you think that's rude? It's not rude. I don't want to waste your time and I don't want to waste mine because mine's ticking away. Do you attack time with an urgency? Or do you wake up one day and go, what the hell happened to the time? Where did it all go? There's so many people, and you know them, that wake up one day and say, you know, I'll never. Now, when it first started, it was someday I'll. Someday I'll go to Bora Bora. Someday I'll sail the world. Someday I'll. And then it was one day I'll. And then you know them. Many people wake up one day and say, I'll never. And it's because they didn't use that $86,000 they had every day. It's a perishable commodity. So do you use it with the urgency of it? Secondly, it's the only thing that winners and losers have in common. Now that sounds negative, but it should be freeing. It should be like, wow, no matter what's happened to me before today, I have control of my thoughts, I have control of my words, I have control of my actions. And I can actually use what little time I have available to me and invest it in certain ways to move me forward. Let's say that pillar is what I hope to be. Today I got $86,000. I can invest it in moving closer to the pillar. And every action that I take that doesn't move me into the pillar is a waste of time. And how many of you know people that take a step away from the pillar, away from the pillar, away from the pillar through the choices that they make, and they just wake up one day and say, I'm so far freaking away from that pillar, I quit. How many of you know somebody like that? They, not literally necessarily, not, they don't necessarily check out of life, but they figuratively check out of life because they got so far away from the pillar. They got so far off the path. That's because they didn't understand that time is something that I am given, a gift I'm given. The old expression, yesterday's a canceled check, tomorrow's a promissory note, today's the only cash I have. I must use it reactively or proactively. I can use it intentionally or I can, I can think to myself, where did it go? 
big picture holistic systems thinking would be that I create an intentional system to be able to squeeze the most of it. Time. Pareto's law. Does anybody know who Pareto was? It's like we're doing a, uh, an exploration of former mathematicians, right? <laughs> From Archimedes, Pareto. Anybody know who Pareto was? Pareto said this. Go ahead. So, that's right. So here's what Pareto said. Pareto said there was some activities that when done give you a greater return for the time invested. That when you did them, you got a lot more. He said that 20% that of the activity created 80% of the result. How many of you would just agree with that on the surface? You'd say, that's, yeah, that's true about my life. There are certain things I do that get me more. He also said this, there's certain things I do that when done get me what? Less. They actually suck your time. So Pareto is clear to us, and we should understand this. And imagine this. Imagine if I started my week by planning these activities and putting them in my week before I planned anything else. I'll give you an example. How many of you know that my wife's name is Gina? Someday you'll meet mysterious Gina. I don't know when, but you'll, she actually is a person, Gina. Gina and I have been married 13 years. It took me some time, but I came to realize what the, uh, oh, side note, we call these high return on investment activities or high return activities, right? Or high return on investment. So high ROI, just like in business, right? Remember the money metaphor. So I used to think that the high return on investment activity with Gina was, let's sit down, we'll watch a chick flick, eat a little popcorn, cuddle on the couch, it's gonna be awesome. Nothing. Okay, let me go out to dinner, let's go out to dinner and fancy dinner and I'll give you a gift and it'll be awesome. You know what the number one high return on investment activity I can do with my wife is? Take her to a Broadway show. It doesn't have to even be in Broadway. Just take her to the nearest regional theater show. Why? Former dancer, danced all over the world, loves Broadway, so on and so forth. That's fulfilling to her, meaningful to her. I can do one Broadway show. Do you know how much it cost me? It cost me five hours. Cost me dinner, cost me a boring show. I pretend to be awake, but I... <laughs> Well, listen, listen, I'm dead serious. Cost me, you know, I got to listen to what's going on. I got to sleep with my eyes open. I can't be like, you know, I got to be like this. Because if she catches me sleeping, how many of you know I'm dead? <laughs> totally dead, man, totally dead. But do you know how many months that buys me? That buys me like four or five months. <laughs> silly, totally silly, totally ridiculous. But if you call Gina right now, call her right now. 888-957-8743, extension 5. I'm four, she's five. If you call her right now, she's like, oh, yeah, he's right. If he takes me to a Broadway show, I'm good for about four or five months. I'll, I'll change the poopy diapers. I'll pick up the crap. I'll do all that. Just need. Why am I using this example? It's a high return on investment activity. Twelve nights on the couch watching chick flicks. Can't match this. Fourteen dinners with little gifts. Can't match this. This is the highest return on investment activity I can do with my spouse. Now, here's the funny thing about your life. Spouse, parent, worker, employer, volunteer, time for yourself, your faith, friendships, you're somebody's child. How many agree with me? I'm listing all the roles you play in your life. And there's not enough time, not enough of the 168 hours for you to play all those roles, yes or no? There's not. So wouldn't it be in my best interest to identify the high return on investment activities in each one of those roles? so that I can maximize the use of my time. Is this making sense to anybody? And wouldn't it make sense for me to do that proactively? Yeah, it would. And I'll teach you a way to do that. And we'll utilize some time blocking techniques and things like that so that more time than not, more days than not, I'm involving myself on the activities that will provide me the greatest returns. And I'm eliminating spending time in the activities that provide me the lowest. The first step is what? The awareness, isn't it? That's why at the end, not next week, but the beginning of the following week, you're going to track your time. And because you're first next week, at some point, you're going to identify these high return on activities. And then you're going to track your time to see if you're actually doing them. I love sitting with salespeople. 
I love sitting with salespeople or business development people. And I say to them, are you reaching your goals? No, I'm not reaching my goals. Give me the seven activities that you can do that will really create business development, leads and closings and the like. And they tell me what they are. And then we track their time for a week. And you know what I usually find? Of those seven, how many hours are they spending doing those? One. Maybe an hour and a half. And they wonder why they're not hitting their sales goals. They know what the activities are, but their day gets away from them. Here's an example. Low return on investment activity, email. How many of you are sucked into urgency addiction? What do I mean by that? Email comes in, you answer it immediately. Email comes in, you answer it immediately. Phone call rings, you answer it immediately. Email comes in, you answer it immediately. Blackberry goes off, you answer it immediately. And by the time you get to the end of your day, you're exhausted. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you look back and go, I didn't do shit today. <laughs> but dang, I was busy! That's because you're urgency addicted. Instead of saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to involve myself in high return on investment activities. Oh, do I need to answer email? Sure. I'll answer email for a half hour in the morning. I'll answer email for midday. I'll answer email in the afternoon. But unless it's an urgent, have to respond immediately email, I will not respond because there's other activities that take precedence that will get me to my goals faster, that will get me to that pillar faster. And email in it, how many of you would agree? Urgency addicted. So Pareto, Archimedes. So Archimedes, give me the, let me build the right system. I can take on the challenge of feeling overwhelmed because I'll have a better system. I can take on the challenge of seemingly not having enough time because my fulcrum and lever, and what's the fulcrum and lever metaphorically? A system to maximize the utilization of your time. Now, why is this important? You can't be a great dad if you don't know how to do this. What do you mean? Because you won't spend enough time with your kid. You can't be a great spouse if you don't know how to do this because you won't spend enough time, meaningful time with your spouse. You can't be a great employer if you don't know how to do this because you'll never be able to build the trusting relationships because you'll be too You probably can't be an effective board member or community member if you don't know how to do this because you'll never allocate the appropriate time and something will lose. Your family will lose because you're out doing community so much or you'll focus completely on family and you'll never fulfill your civic responsibility to build a better community. Am I making sense on any of this? That's why this is so vital and that's why we're all going to learn it. Would you rather align yourself with someone who seems to be able to get a lot done in a short period of time or someone that's completely unorganized? Right? Simple question. Okay. Okay, we're good. What time is it on your guys' watch? What time? What is it? 20 to 9. So we have five minutes, right? Yep. Go. At the beginning, you said that time is different than time management. Maximizing the utilization of your time is different than time management. Because time management is how do I organize my day? Maximizing utilization of your time, which you'll find as we unpack it next week, is about understanding where I'm headed in my life, that pillar, proactively identifying the activities that will get me there faster. And then on a weekly basis, ensuring that I've scheduled those times first. That's different than saying, I've got these appointments next week. I've got these to-do list things I need to do next week. Let me make sure I get them on the calendar. Does that make sense? Yes. Completely different. Now, will there be some of that? Absolutely, there'll be some of that. Because I do have deadlines to meet, and I do have a meeting, and I do have these things. But the first thing I'm going to do is book appointments with myself. I don't blow off appointments with others. See, here's what happens all the time. I'm getting a little bit in the weeds on this. You'll hear it next week. But these high return on investment activities, you might know in your head you need to do them. But you get to Friday and you look back and go, damn, I didn't do that. I know I need to call those clients and I just haven't had time to call them. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or I know I need to go meet with those people and I, oh, I just didn't have time to do it. Do you blow off an appointment most of the time with someone else? No. So what we're going to learn is the technique of making an appointment with myself. Some people call it time blocking. And the first thing I'm going to make an appointment with myself to do is those high return on investment activities. Do you know that I actually put in my calendar time with my kid? Oh, Ian, that's disgusting that you have to put in your calendar time with your kid. Would you rather put it in your calendar to make sure you have time with your kid or would you rather be late to the soccer game? I think I'd rather put the time in the calendar to make sure that I'm there for my kid. 
so she's not got pierced ears and pierced face and tattoos all over her body throwing plates at me when she's 16 talking about where the hell were you when I was a kid. <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Here's my point. So you, you, ask, you, ask a very, you ask a very, very good question. That question of what's the difference. The difference is the depth and the breadth and the intentionality. Managing my time is making sure I have my appointments in my calendar, making sure I have my to-do list written, and making sure I try to get all that stuff done by the end of the week. Typically, it's not connected to anything beyond that week. Instead, I will know where I'm headed with my life. I will know the roles that I play in my life. I will know the high return on investment activities in each one of those roles. I will proactively schedule those first by making an appointment with myself and blocking that time. And then I'll put in the appointments. And then I'll put in the assumptives, which is really, really deep. When I start to look at my schedule and just kind of assume what's going to happen. Like anybody that's a boss in this room, you walk in first thing on a Monday morning. You've probably scheduled a meeting, but everybody wants your time and both lose. Because you can't have your meeting because everybody wants your time. Instead, you're going to look at the natural flow of life and say, I will never schedule a meeting at 8 a.m. Because I'm the boss and everybody wants my time. I say that just makes sense. But how many of you know bosses that schedule meetings at 8 a.m.? And then everybody wants their time. So either the people in the meeting get screwed while they watch their boss talk to everybody else, wasting their time, or the urgent crisis gets screwed. So instead, I'll go with the flow of my natural occurrence of life. What I just described is fundamentally different than managing time. Make sense now? Yes. Okay. Okay, now, two things, or a couple things that we haven't talked about. Communication. So, Aristotle. Have you ever heard of Aristotle? Yes. Okay. I know, it's all Greek and Romans, ladies and gentlemen. It's all Greek and Romans. Because nothing new under the sun. These guys were pretty bright. Aristotle came up with a system for communication. Unfortunately, Ari was a little lacking, and so I've added. I know, me and Aristotle. I've added to Aristotle. And so there's going to be a video, not next week, but the following week, up on the website, about a system for communication. See, Aristotle said it was about the sender, the message, and the receiver, that that was the system, the sender, the message, and the receiver. I think it's more than that. The sender, the message, the conduit that I communicate through, the receiver the understanding and the impact. That that's a true communication cycle or system. I've got to worry about all of that to have complete communication. That sounds really in depth. Yeah, kind of like this system, it has some depth to it. However, once I start to do it and do it and do it and do it, it becomes 80% of my unconscious behavior. Motivation. Some of you in the room are, let me borrow that again. Some of you in the room are longing for, asking for, and trying to understand how can, and maybe you're even doing this. This is going to be a little overt and a little offensive perhaps, but it's going to sound really arrogant. But maybe you're even saying to yourself, you know, I wish I could motivate people like Ian. Don't be like Ian. Because this isn't the kind of motivation that's effective over a long period of time. It works for about 15 weeks. But how many of you know this gets a little old after a period of time? Right? Imagine being married to this every day. Right? Ooh, that's rough. So what I'm going to try to prove to you is your impression of what it takes to be a great motivator is not what the times require. That the times require a different approach. And so we'll teach you a different system because motivation is just this. How do I move another human being into action? Ultimately, we want to teach people how to be self-motivated, right? And so we'll walk you through a system over the next three weeks. Now remember, and please don't forget, there's going to be more information than you could possibly assimilate in three weeks. So as stuff comes out, make sure you're looking at yourself, your surveys, look, make sure you're looking at the leadership history, that leadership style inventory, all that information to pick out what you need to work on. Make sense? And then take that information. Time we will all do. Final thought. Well, I'm going to give you a final thought and I'm going to ask a question. Final thought, Monday morning, I'm going to send out an email. We're going to start the discussion of time. Also in that email, there will be the link, and it will say, make your commitment. Now, you don't have to make it on Monday morning, but you're going to have to make your commitment. If you don't make a commitment, I will follow up with you. At first, it will be a gentle nudge. It will just be a nudge. Hey, holla. Didn't get your commitment. Yeah. 
right? It'll just be that. And then it'll each time it'll get a little bit more, hey, are we going to do this or not? Are we in or are we out? Are you going to make a commitment? And you might push back to me, and that's okay, and just say, Ian, don't bother me anymore. I'm not going to make a commitment. Fair enough. Fair enough. But I would then question, why are we even doing this? If you're not going to actually pick out one thing, remember we wrote those three names down of the people whose lives might be better if you were willing to make a commitment? And can you imagine if 350 people who are going through this program throughout the region actually picked out one thing and then tried to get better at it? What would that do for your self-esteem? What would that do for the people around you? What would that do for the trust and respect of others? Significant. So know on Monday morning you're getting that link. If you don't like to do things online and you'd rather do it hard copy, I'll include that. You fill it out, scan it in, and email it to me. The only people that see the commitment is you and me. You and me. Now, you might choose to have some accountability partner. That's fine. And there'll be a space for that. But let's get better at something. Let's not waste our time. You're taking time away from your family, right? I'm taking time away from my family. I guarantee you right now, when I walk over to my little iPhone over there, I guarantee you there's a text from Nia. I guarantee you there's a text from Nadia and a text from Kian saying, Good night, Daddy. I guarantee it. They love me and I love them. And I'm taking some of my $86,000 away from them to spend with you. Don't disrespect that. Just like I don't want to disrespect the time you're taking away from your loved ones. That's why this has to be meaningful. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so for them, for us, for all of us in the room, pick out one thing. And you should by now, six weeks worth, have enough information to pick out something meaningful. I'm going to tell you what mine will be. Oh, I'm playing too. So let me tell you what mine's going to be. I just said a moment ago that it must be difficult every day to be in a house with this. That every day is the Grey Cup Championship. That every day is the Stanley Cup seventh game. That every day is the Super Bowl. Because every day is for me, right? $86,000, we got to use them. Ah! Can you imagine living with that? <laughs> Tragically, every day is not the Super Bowl. Every day is not the seventh game of the Stanley Cup. And every day is not the Great Cup. And I need to chill out sometimes with my kids. And I just got to let them be kids. I I'm trying to grow world changers. But you know what? They're 8 and 9 and 6, or 10 and 9 and 6. Uh, i got to just love them like a papa sometimes. And we just need to hang out on the couch and do nothing. And the best use of the time would be just to hug them and love them. So my commitment to you is over the next nine weeks, that's what I'm going to work on. Because that's what i got to get better at. You say, why are you emotional? Because I'm freaking tired today. Guy, we've been working since 6 a.m., right? Tired. So that's the depth and breadth that I hope you'll approach this with. I know Nia, Nadia, and Kim will be better if I chill out a little, gear back a little, Dad. So that's what I'll do. And how am I going to check? At the end of the nine weeks, I'll bring a video from Nia and Nadia, and they'll tell you whether I got better or not. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. And then I'll give them 100 bucks, and I'll do all the other <laughs> <laughs> Ice cream. That's right, ice cream. So that's the depth. Okay, I got to get better. And so I've now, uh, we told Fort Chip that last night, told you, because the other two, three tracks are a, a session behind you, next time they'll hear that, which means 350 people will hold me accountable. Because I've got to change this, man. And I haven't been able to change it up until now. So I've got to change it. Because at some point, they're going to push back on me. They're good now. They want to go to Ghana. They want to change the world. But at some point, they're going to push back. I hope you'll take this as an opportunity to give the same depth and breadth of thought. But that's okay if you just come back to me and say, I need to be a better listener at work. Cool. I need to improve the system at work of how do we file whatever. Cool. I need to lose five pounds. Cool. I don't care. Just come up with something. Fair enough? Final thing. Somebody take me, tell me something you're taking away from tonight. Somebody tell me something you're taking away from this evening. Somebody tell me something you're taking away from tonight. Courageous thinking, courageous conversations. All right? Somebody else. Something you're taking away from tonight. Yes, Susan. Always begin with the desired outcome. What does it look like, smell like, feel like? Okay, somebody else. Somebody tell me something. Trevor. I need to be aware of the systems that have Both tangible and intangible. The ones that have organically grown up that didn't have a point or a purpose, but they've taken cold. They, that's sort of what we do around here. Or the ones that were developed for a specific purpose, are they even relevant anymore? Are the conditions that they were trying to solve or affect even in existence? Somebody else, something you're taking away from tonight. Yes. The ROI for my 
Absolutely. That I, I, there are some activities that give me a greater ROI, some activities that give me a lower, lower ROI. If I can pick them proactively out, block it into my schedule, make sure that I'm doing that consistently, I'm more likely to reach the dreams and aspirations I've set for myself and others. Somebody else, something you're taking away, yes? Change your attitude. How many of you agree with me? That's the most profound thing we've heard so far. Because if you'll change that, everything else will follow. <laughs> Did you hear what she said? She said my survey reflected that. <laughs> so very good. That was kind of like you going, uh-huh, yeah, yeah. There you go, perfect. Anybody else, something you're taking away from tonight? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we're, it's bad. It's really, really bad, man. That thing, that phone, that instant message, that 140 characters, all that stuff, man, it just feeds it. And unfortunately, expediency doesn't build, didn't paint the Sistine Chapel. Expediency didn't build the pyramids. Expediency didn't build the Great Wall. Most of the greatest movements of men and women and society weren't done through expediency. Hmm? They've been done through a lot of things. You know what expediency got us? How to kill more people faster called a nuclear weapon. That's what expediency oftentimes gets us. Or on Highway 63. No, or on Highway 63. That's right. All right, guys. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your commitment to this community to be here till 845, 9 o'clock every couple of weeks and the time and energy that you're putting in. I appreciate you doing it. Have a great night. Thank you. You're welcome, guys.